Hello. Our story begins inside of Mos Espa. Legendary gunslinger Django Fett was lazily wandering around the town, looking at shops and different cantinas. He'd already had a couple shots, after a bounty hunter paid for a shot for helping with a bounty out on Ord Mantel. Jabba paid big for that specific catch, so Django was getting a little extra bit of the love. The dusty streets of the city were certainly something. As Django was popping by food stands to look for some good food, he got distracted by something. His eyes twisted around as there seemed to be something going on, until one of the vendors on the street stopped him, shoving an already open hologram into his face. Lego is pretty cool, don't you think? You know what else is pretty cool? Light kits to bring your Lego sets to life. As can be seen here, the Tantive 4 looks like it's straight out of the hit Star Wars movie, Star Wars. Some power converters! This awesome light kit here comes from Light My Bricks, a fantastic company that helps you bring your Lego sets to life. There are two ways to approach adding your Light My Bricks lights. You can add them as you're building your brand new set, or you can add them to an already finished set. It doesn't take more than 25 minutes and the results are stunning. Wow. Look at that glow. Light My Bricks has the thinnest cords in the game, with their latest version of sets. This makes sure your build doesn't have protruding wires while also bringing it to life. Use my code PPSW15, which will be active until November 14th, to get 15% off on your purchases. Special thanks to Light My Bricks for sponsoring today's video. The Mandalorian bounty hunter moved past the man and then stopped when he heard a commotion. He sauntered over and looked in. Maybe it wasn't his business, but based off the high-pitched voice, someone's grunt was picking on a kid. Django, as a bounty hunter, was very content with letting people slide doing atrocious things. Sometimes it could be as harsh as an execution, but he had a couple lines that he refused to cross, and in his own opinion, picking on a kid was one of them. He stepped over with his helmet on and gazed down at a little kid holding a small mechanical piece. The grunt shoved the boy back. It was a blue Twi'lek. He seemed pretty pissed. Django's firm voice rolled over the man's back and towards the kid, asking what all his bickering was for. The grunt turned back and told the cosplayer to eat it. This didn't concern him. <laughs> this obviously wasn't the first time such an insult was thrown his way, because Mandalorians with traditional armor weren't common to see around the galaxy these days. Django walked up towards the grunt and lowered his head, and asked him if he would mind explaining the situation kindly. The Twi'lek laid his paw on Django's armor, and Django still didn't respond. He just looked at him. The man said that this kid has been seen here stripping parts we could build a pod racer. The man twisted around as if to backhand the boy, and as he moved his arm, it was snatched firmly by Django's hand, who twisted his head and very sternly said, uh-uh. The man got clobbered in the jaw and flew into the trash behind him. He wasn't unconscious either. He shook himself off and told the Mando scum that slaves did not have a right to race, a right to steal, and they might as well not have a right to think. Django gripped the man by the throat and told him that those same thoughts could very easily fit the description of himself, before whacking the man once more and knocking him out cold. Django turned back and told the kid he was free to go, and turned around and started walking away. In a funny way, Django stepped like there was a hitch in his armor, but he was simply lost in the sauce, feeling a little vibrant. Anakin followed the Mandalorian bounty hunter around like a shadow, and funnily enough, Django didn't notice until he stopped to get a snack and jumped back. Anakin actually startled him. The bounty hunter took his helmet off and asked the kid what he wanted. Did he want credits or something? Anakin shook his head. He just wanted to know more about him. Not just anyone would stand up for a slave. Django's eyes rolled around in his head as he searched for an answer. He wasn't sozzled. Well... <laughs> Just a little. What was Anakin saying again? His head shifted back and forth, and then he got a food on a stick before dropping a credit or two on the counter. He looked down at Anakin and asked him, what did he say again? Anakin laughed a little, wondering aloud about why a bounty hunter would save a slave when there was nothing to profit from it. Django just tilted his head with a little confusion as he watched Anakin walk off into the crowd. What a funny little guy, he thought to himself, as he walked away and into the hangar bay where Slave One was landed. The bay doors were open, and he tossed his helmet onto a rack and settled in, munching on his little food stick and falling asleep with half of an eaten meal on his chest. Luckily, it wasn't on top of the Mandalorian armor. When Django woke up, he slipped back and forth around the bay of the ship and found the bathroom to wash his face. As he washed off his clothes and put on a new pair, he was confronted by the hangar operator. 
asking for the credits for the night's stay, and he tossed a couple credits at them. Django's head was pulsating. What a trip. He didn't understand why he was so loopy. He prepared to leave again to get some more food, considering the pay for the hangar lasted until the end of the evening. As he was getting ready to leave, he remembered that he had a little weird interaction with a slave child yesterday. Some of it was blurry. Maybe he was a little more sozzled than he liked to admit. He walked out into the hangar, and as he left, he was confronted by three or four individuals. With them was a Twi'lek from the day before. But he didn't really remember that either. The grunts tried to tell Jenga that he was in big trouble, and each of them were left with broken bones in their faces as he walked away to get some sobering food. Django found himself inside of a local cantina on the weekend. It was packed, and as he was standing there, a little voice called out to him, and he turned over, seeing the kid from the day before. What are the odds? Anakin asked how he was doing, and Django just shrugged, as Anakin insisted that he join them for brunch. Django followed suit, and sat with Shmi and Anakin, who were on the same side of the booth. Initially, the conversation was stiff, partly because Django was still unalive from the previous day. He must have slept a good 18 or so hours. He was exhausted, probably why the shots went straight through him. Regardless, he learned that these two were slaves and Anakin properly thanked Django for saving him yesterday. The bounty hunter didn't think much of it. He was actually pretty happy with this little deal here. They were kind to him and they enjoyed a nice brunch inside of the cantina. Some of the best food in those Espa for the locals. Someone like Django happened to stroll in here, but this location was typically frequented by the locals of the town, not by outsiders. It was nice though, they talked about life, he told them stories, gave Anakin antidotes, and it was a much cooler environment for Django. See, the life of a bounty hunter was often filled with barbaric stories, harassment which Django never partook in, and even was disgusted by, and loudmouths taking shots at each other. Truthfully, which Django didn't know, most of these hotheads acted like that because they wanted Django's approval. Sometimes he'd get a laugh in, but most times, especially when the foolish ghouls were harassing people, he'd bust their heads into the tables and whatnot. He didn't appreciate the behavior. So being with Anakin and Shmi was nice because they could have a deeper conversation that wasn't so surface level. Django did feel a sense of shame for them because he wasn't the biggest advocate for slavery. He couldn't say much because he had transported slaves for a job or two, but still, he felt some sense of pity or shame that they were stuck in their predicament. He would leave Tatooine and go see the galaxy, and they wouldn't. After today, it was back to the slave works. This was an odd occasion for them anyways. Watto didn't give them credits to be slaves, but sometimes he'd give them a credit or two, and Shmi always saved it so Anakin could be taken out for a nice lunch whenever they had a chance, and this was that. The conversation moved on long past their food, and even into the hours beyond the kitchen closing in the early afternoon before supper started. They just had a good time, and Django enjoyed the simplicity of talking with others that weren't trying to suck up to him. He was a simple man, trying to make his way around the galaxy with ease. He had just been given a huge payment from Damask Holdings to do a big time job for some type of army, and while there was a promise of an extra incentive there, truthfully, having considered things, he liked the idea of this little group here. However, there was something he was concerned about. He understood the vulnerability of being placed into this predicament. Shmi and Anakin would lose everything if he bought them, because they were slaves from the hovel and they weren't allowed to keep their stuff, and they'd be forced to move out. It incentivized individuals to remain slaves because it was better for them or something. Regardless, Django didn't want Shmi or Anakin to feel pressured to be his friends, and he did mean friends by the simplest of terms. Anakin's excitement was inspiration for his mind, and Shmi's calmness was warmth for his soul. So as they were talking, he threw it out in the air and it lingered. Shmi and Anakin looked to each other to confirm what they thought they had heard, and Django felt like he had made a mistake, though he hadn't. The two of them were just surprised. Shmi was understandably standoffish about this, because they had just met Django. What if he was going to use them, or expose them, or who knows what else? She didn't want Anakin's life to get worse. Django explained the miniature plan he had just concocted in his mind, because he did actually want a family for a long time, but it was hard to have one when you're a bounty hunter. You can't just do that with the rapid needs of such a job. So he offered it to them and said that there was a location at Salukamai where he could give them refuge and he wouldn't bother them, even if they didn't want much to do with him. Django, in a way, felt like he was digging himself a hole, because it kind of was. He spoke on a whim and surprised even himself that he had. He was just trying to make the best of the situation at the moment. He told them that on Salukamai they could live and start a new life, 
one that could or could not involve him as a friend. At the end of the day, Django just wanted real friends, and he felt like this was the first step to doing it. He did want a kid, and cloning himself to have one was an easy way of obtaining that. But even in his own mind, having a kid wasn't so he could force them to be the exact replica of himself. Having a child is to guide a young individual who was completely unique as a human being, one that did not have to bend or break to their parents' rules or lifestyle, and let them grow. He could see that possibility here with Anakin. Shmi asked that they have a moment to talk, so he gave it, and when the time came, they accepted, though they would like to see the location first and have more than his word that they would be protected there, and that this wasn't some type of trap. Because traps like this did exist, where rich or bounty hunters played off the desperation of others, and used it to their own benefit. Django had killed many individuals like that in his life, but he gave the evidence and the two of them accepted. It would take hours of negotiating and threatening to light Wada's wings on fire for Django to seal the deal. And because he wanted to ensure Anakin and Shmi weren't being taken advantage of, he snuck C-3PO into the Slave 1 and used a hyperlock on the bottom of the ship just below the engines to attach the pod racer, so Anakin could continue to build it. The ride to Salukamai was quiet, mostly because Django didn't have a ton of blankets and space was really cold, especially for people from Tatooine. But they eventually got there. It was a small home just outside of a village. There were electrified fences around the home, and there was room for Anakin's pod racer, which Django placed there. Shmi asked why he had this place, and he told her the honest truth, expressing that if he ever found someone he ever truly cared about, he'd bring them here, and he just never did. He then expressed that this home was theirs. He didn't want anything from them other than their friendship. In a way, it felt like he had sold himself out, and he kind of did, but he believed that this was the right decision to make. Then, after all of it, he just left. Truthfully, he was just as confused as they were. Maybe it was the first time he had a normal human interaction pretty much in his entire life. Maybe it was the hangover talking. Maybe he was desperately in need of a true friendship. He didn't really know. He did cancel the order for his personal clone for himself, which the Keminoans didn't care. They would still make Alpha and Omega for their own good. Django sat inside Slave 1 outside of Salukamai for a couple hours, just looking off into space and thinking to himself. He had plenty of credits, he just didn't know what to do with them, and so he bought some slaves. Okay, makes sense, not really. But he sat and thought about it. Growing up on Concord Dawn as a Mandalorian foundling, he was trained to fight. There weren't too many real emotions shared aside from camaraderie. He killed hundreds as a Mandalorian, but eventually became a bounty hunter, one of the highest paid and most renowned in the galaxy, and that wasn't a squishy life. He believed that, in part to his hangover, some of his neglected emotions were realized when he saw that he didn't have to create a child from his own genetic template. He could have friends and family through a natural bond formed over time. Django had absolutely no intention to fall in love with Shmi, seeing it as an offshoot of Stockholm Syndrome, but Skywalker, that could be a kid of his. That would just have to wait though, and it would simply depend on how the times changed. Who knew what would come next? All he knew is that there were people who were now grateful for him. Not for doing a job, or for killing someone, or stealing something, but for being a decent person. The fulfillment that gave him was something he didn't really know how to consciously accept. While Django's life returned to a normal life of bounty hunting, Anakin and Shmi remained perpetually confused. They had no clue why Django bought them and then dipped. Shmi personally believed that it was the guilt for slaughtering people, or that it was truly loneliness, but she was still on edge. Who knows if Django would come back with his buddies, or if he was secretly keeping here, or if he was secretly keeping them here until he lost his cool. At this current moment in time, she planned on getting a job, and making sure they had enough credits to get off world so they could be safe, especially if the time came that he did come back. Though she didn't tell this to Anakin, fearing that it could make him upset they did have a communication device that could get them into contact with him if they needed anything, but Shmi had no intention of using it. For the time being, Anakin was going to go to the school so that he could make friends, Shmi was going to go to work so that she could make the credits necessary to leave, and that was that. Anakin would continue to build C-3PO on his pod racer, and Shmi would try and help pay for it, but her greatest concern was their current well-being and of their future one. For the next several months, the two of them would begin to have an actual normal life here on Salukamai. Django didn't pop by or bother them, as he lived a life questioning what he actually wanted in life. He was in his mid-30s, and he had no concrete direction aside from bounty hunting. The deal with Tyrannus was good, 
but the bounty hunting life called for more, and the more time he spent around these hooligans that wanted to impress him by having ego contests at lunches and dinners around the galaxy, the more he resented the job he had. Django began to long for the conversation he had with Shmi and Anakin and Mos Espa, so what he did was buy something for both of them. He got Anakin some shielding parts for C-3PO, and he got Shmi some luxury stones from the Cantonica sector. As someone who never truly understood love, even in his most basic forms, he tried to comprehend it through gift giving, as if to be loved, he had to buy it, when in reality it was never that difficult. Sometimes you put yourself out there and you get hurt, other times you'll find fulfillment. In both cases, the result will always be okay. When Jenga returned to Salukamai, he gifted the parts to Anakin, and he was oh so excited, and he gifted the stones to Shmi, who was very grateful and surprised. Django didn't sleep inside the house as to ensure they didn't feel like he was encroaching on their new home, but they never found that to be the case. On one of the nights while Django was here, after spending a number of hours working with Anakin on his pod racer, he had time to speak with Shmi alone. Their conversation was a lot heavier than any of the talks with Anakin around them. Shmi was just curious. Why? She had assumed kind of correctly about him, believing that love needed to be bought. And while neither Django or Shmi was looking for something romantic, the love in even the most basic friendship is essential to human connection. Shmi understood this, and Django finally got to learn that he didn't need to give anything to get it. But specifically for Anakin, all she asked is that he spend more time with the boy. Shmi was a strong individual, she never relied on anyone, and always had her own back. She was content with that. The job and life she had here on Salukumai was fantastic and she was eternally grateful for Django's kindness. But she realized that Anakin needed Django, and Django needed Anakin, more than Django even realized. And that's all she wanted for Anakin. And if it would make Django happy, then that would be an added benefit. Shmi just requested that he never get her son into the bounty hunting game, and he promised that he wouldn't. Following this conversation, Django learned how to loosen himself up. He was no longer stiff with his words, his approach to the family, he now considered his family, was kind and compassionate. He would bring both Shmi and Anakin gifts after bounties, because gift giving just so happened to be one of his love languages. But for Django, he began to enjoy the simplicities of life with people who appreciated him for him. Yes, the Skywalkers were thankful for their freedom, but more than anything, the connection between them was what mattered the most. Django became the first true father figure Anakin ever had. When Django first found Skywalker, he was only eight and a half or so, so the influence he had on Anakin was absorbed like a sponge. Django did continue to bounty hunt for the months following this initial conversation with Shmi, but the missions became shorter and shorter. He came back to Salukamai more and more because he enjoyed spending time with Anakin. They bonded over mechanical work, specifically on the pod racer and on 3PO. Django would frequently bring parts back to Salukamai so Anakin could build his racer for real. For the most part, these moments would be great. As all good parents know, the key to being a good parent is distracting the child with something while feeding them their theories. That's what Django did. <laughs> he would sit there with Anakin, allowing the kid to build his racer while he sat on the ground and pointed to different circuits that Anakin needed to use and tell him his theories on the galaxy. Mostly joking. For the most part, Django would let Anakin figure this out on his own because he believed that it was important for Anakin to put things together himself but he supported Anakin's work and the pod racer full-heartedly. Through these months, Django's own personality would shift, and he would start to value a more grounded moral in life. He didn't see the value in bounty hunting. He only truly cared about being around Shmi and Anakin. Django noticed this because he was always on missions and thinking of stories to tell his friends. Anakin adored the stories, and Shmi was always cautious about this. But because Anakin was happy, that's all that mattered. Their lives would continue to drastically get better. Django decided to stop taking calls from mob bosses, because he wished to spend more time with his family. Anakin started to refer to Django as dad, as the years went by, and despite the galaxy shifting around them politically, it did not affect their lives. Django started to concern himself with the potential implications of the war that was to come, and how that might impact Anakin's life as he grew up into a young adult. Though Django made sure that he was the right inspiration for Anakin. The most important thing he hammered down on was making sure Anakin didn't choose a path of bounty hunting for himself. This was something Shmi expressed distaste in many times, and while she was able to understand why Django chose that path, 
she did not want it for Anakin. Though she was okay with Anakin learning how to become a gunslinger because it was a dangerous galaxy after all and he needed to be protected. Despite Anakin and Jango thriving through mechanics, their relationship developed outside of it, through piloting, gunslinging, and even racing against each other. Jango saw that Anakin thrived from extracurricular activities, and he always preferred to be around Jango as compared to his own friends. It was simply based on their relationship as father and son. Anakin enjoyed his friends, but Jango understood him unlike anyone else. When Anakin reached his late teens, Jango decided to do something erratic. He had saved up thousands of credits and wasn't using them, but he wanted to do something more with his life. He decided that the best thing to do was ask Tyrannus for another investment. He knew that Dooku was involved with a growing Separatist movement. Jango had absolutely no intention to be part of the CIS or to serve them during the war, but he wanted to make sure he did something worth living for. After having truly lived a life of love with his new family, one not connected by any type of romantic love, he decided that he would try and make a difference on a larger scale. Within Jango's heart, he saw Anakin's transformation over the years. He watched a boy who had no one except a couple friends and his mother grow into a vibrant young man who was eager, excitable, and ambitious. He had friends that inspired him, and he built his pod racer and 3PO with enjoyment. Though something that did change was his attempt to build the pod racer and why he did it. Jango didn't take the enjoyment away from him. But Anakin no longer was building the racer out of desperation, which was a great thing. He simply built the pod racer because he wanted to complete it, and he used it on Seleucami just without racing with anyone else. As he got older, his ideas on what he wanted in life continued to expand, but no matter what Skywalker wanted, Jango and Shmi supported it. This for Jango was incredibly special, and while he and Shmi had a tight relationship, they never formed any sort of romantic attachment to each other. Morally, Shmi would never be with someone that was a bounty hunter. She didn't agree with the lifestyle and what it entailed. And the other thing is, they just never had any attraction chemistry with each other. The other's company was all they needed. On top of that, Django just enjoyed that his friend was living her life with intention and enjoyment. Her job inside the local town made her happy. Anakin was content which brought peace to her heart, and Shmi had her own friends, who frequently got together. It was small, but it was perfect. But it was through all of this that Jango realized that his purpose in life wasn't to kill without reason or for a paycheck. It was to save others. Jango reached out to Tyrannus for a meeting and they sat down inside of Castle Sereno for this talk. The bounty hunter expressed his desires and why he wished to accomplish them. Dooku thought about this momentarily. So if he was understanding this correctly, Jango wanted to use a sect of the droid army, say a planetary fleet, so that he could liberate slaves? That wasn't exactly a great use of resources, but why? The most infamous gunslinger in the galaxy, the most renowned bounty hunter, wanted to throw his life away to save some slaves? Who cared about them? They were all going to die at some point and their lives would change literally nothing. This rhetoric sickened Jango to his soul, because he had seen what two quote unquote useless life forms were capable of. Anakin Ishmi had changed his own life for the better, and Dooku regarded these sentient beings like they were nothing. But Dooku decided that a deal could be made out of this. He told Jango that he would agree to this deal if the droids were not aligned with the Separatists, if the territory he conquered was given over to the future CIS, and he had to, without a question or a shadow of a doubt, complete any mission for him whenever he requested. Jango nodded his head and agreed to those odds. He would eventually receive his battle droids and his miniature fleet, which was far larger than he ever assumed it would be. But he decided to use Anakin's paint scheme for the color of his pod racer for the individual droids, and of course, the cruisers and frigates inside the fleet itself. Jango was hopeful that Dooku wouldn't ask him to do something horrendous, but those hopes would be cut down immediately when Dooku asked of an important mission for him, one that Jango agreed to do. But did he really want to do it? He talked with his family and he didn't really want to do it. The Jango military was stationed in hiding by a moon in the system, far from the planet Seleucami itself. So, he was going on this mission alone. The Clone War had started by this point, and he was going to the planet Mandalore to take down the leader. Dooku believed that Mandalore was a necessary planet for the Separatist victory. The planet had control over the Neutral Systems Coalition, and being that Jango was a Mandalorian, he was going to start a civil war with an assassination. Through the civil war, the Neutral Systems would be forced to join the Separatist or the Republic, which is why Dooku wanted this to happen. Jango never went to the Battle of Geonosis to be a part of, which is why he was still alive. He just happened to be hanging out with Anakin and Shmi on Seleucami when it happened. 
By this point, Django didn't have a chance to make a change in the galaxy. He was only trying to figure out the right places to go and who to liberate. Then he was assigned this mission before he could start. Django was pretty hesitant about making this little strike at these slaver worlds because they were either heavily defended or entrenched with criminals that would fight on behalf of the syndicates. The thing Django didn't consider when he first made this moral agreement is that there were serious geopolitical issues that needed to be dealt with. The criminal syndicates had vast influence and a straight up attack to them could leave more people in peril than not. These quandaries filled his mind as he made his way to Mandalore. When he arrived, he landed outside of the Sundari Dome. Something so integral to his life that he hadn't imparted to Anakin was the Mandalorian way. The reason he never felt the need to teach Anakin that way is because Shmi didn't want Anakin to become a bounty hunter, but also because Jango himself saw Anakin's own potential far beyond just fighting. Didn't mean Anakin did not a fight, just not the full lesson. Despite Jango never caring for the new Mandalorian way, he respected Satine to a degree. Part of this came from the fact that the Death Watch and Clan Vizsla were responsible for much of his own trauma before becoming a foundling, and that he saw Pre Vizsla as a coward. That led to him having a more neutral standpoint towards Satine than Pre Vizsla. Maybe traditional Mandalorians would have seen her as a coward for rejecting the fight, but he knew she, like he, survived the Death Watch and their attacks against Mandalore. So through that, he could have respect for her because they mutually went through something. Now, this led to his personal issue. He didn't want to kill her for one reason, and it was because she and the neutral systems aided slaves and relief efforts in the Outer Rim. Killing her would proactively change everything for what he wanted to accomplish. So, he wanted to make a deal instead of killing her. Django was intermingling himself deep into this plot. But he was desperate to make a change. When he arrived, he went to the Duchess and his armor. Satine knew him by name, because his reputation preceded him. Django removed his helmet and told her that he was here to kill her, but he wished to avoid such a bounty and make an arrangement that would benefit both of them. Wow, great introduction. She wasn't thrilled with that at all, because of course he was going to threaten her life, but she misunderstood what he meant. In all fairness, how could she not? Django told her that Pre Vizsla was an enemy of his and of hers, as he led Death Watch. But he also carried the Darksaber, something that could unify Mandalore. However, there was something more. He wished to learn information from her. He wanted to know about the slave rings and which ones were most vulnerable to an attack, because he would use Death Watch after he killed Vizsla to help her efforts to free slaves. Satine had long been a sponsor of refugee programs to free slaves, so if Django was willing to help her on that front, while also taking out an enemy that wanted her dead that she didn't know was an enemy, then she could kind of agree to that. She didn't like senseless violence, but that was their way, and Django was who he was. Though this also meant that Dooku could become very vengeful, which was of concern for Django, but he had a plan for that. Instead of those concerns, he took Satine's information and relayed the intel to the tactical droid with his task force at Salugamine. They would begin their movement on slaver territory while he was doing his little side quest here. Django was very concerned with Dooku's influence, but there were other ways to maintain his own control over this deal with the Count. When Django got to Concordia, he went to Vizsla's mansion and challenged him for the Darksaber, and this actually frightened Preem. See, Django was one of the most renowned members of their society. Even though he wasn't a pure-blood Mandalorian, being that he was from Conquer Dawn, they referred to him as lesser than them. But he was among the top fighters in the entire Mandalorian society. However, Pre had to accept the terms of this fight, as his men would seem as a coward for not doing so. Django and Pre stood across from each other once Pre got his armor on, and ready themselves for combat. Their hands stood out evenly, ready for their wrestling match to begin. They rushed each other, locking arms and fending off the other. Their fists collided into the other. Despite armor covering their bodies, there were soft cushions hidden across their armor that could be used for seizing the advantage. Pre kicked Django in the upper thigh, jabbing his knee backwards slightly, which he recovered from by planting his other leg and using momentum to drive Vizsla into a pike in the ground. The two of them fell over it, and the one holding the Darksaber ignited the weapon and he swung it around. Django ducked his hip in to avoid it. He tried to go in on the offensive, but Vizsla threw his weapon overhead, which Django pushed his wrists over his own head to block them, which worked brilliantly. He activated his jetpack, throwing the saber from Vizsla's hand, and he turned around in mid-air 
using his pistols to shoot at the Death Watch leader. Django landed on a roof and continued to pepper Pree's armor, forcing him to hide behind cover, then launching a rocket from his jetpack at Django. The Mandalorian bounty hunter leapt off the roof and rolled across the ground. Pree took the advantage and lunged across the battlefield, shoving his fists in the Django's helmet, and despite the advantage being in his control, Django tanked every single shot he took to the face, before rolling around Vizsla and activating the shank on his wrist and cutting the back of Pree's jetpack, before rolling across the ground and grabbing the Darksaber. Pree jumped to the ground and let the jetpack launch off of him into the distance and explode on impact. Django looked down and accessorized the Darksaber before igniting it. Pree roared forward, blasting his weapons at Django, who felt the weight of the weapon mesh with his own energy and he allowed them to harmonize. He blocked the shots he could, rolling around and cutting through one of Vizsla's blasters before sweeping the weapon down under his chest plate, cutting the Death Watch leader across the abdomen. Django kept him across the ground before executing him without a word. Fett turned to the other Death Watch members, standing around him, as he told them that they should look upon this pathetic leader, the one that stood no true chance at beating him and now looked to himself as the true leader of their cult. He raised the dark saber and chanted out the message for Mandalore, which received plenty of echoes from the Death Watch members around him. He expressed that in their first test of strength, he wished to see their fury in battle, and directed them to meet up with his miniature task force in the edge of the Outer Rim. The Mandalorians were all confused by this, but Django insisted that this was for their battle prowess. He had himself a meeting with the Duchess so he could take Mandalore for all of them. There were two legitimate approaches to this and Django would suggest the second one of them. He did actually meet with Satine, he just didn't do what they thought he was going to do. He personally believed that the death of Satine, or even the faking of her death, would disrupt everything, which she also believed. Now with Pre out of the way, there were no more concerns regarding her potential assassination for the time being. So the second option was for her to take all of his evidence with her to Coruscant so that she could reveal the nature of the Clone War and where it came from. This disappointed her greatly. Satine would take the material so that she could hopefully end this war, but she couldn't believe that someone who championed himself on making a difference couldn't have made the biggest impact. Those words sat heavily on his heart, because while he was becoming human again and feeling emotions, he was allowing a galactic divide to form, when doing something could have stopped it from ever happening to begin with. There was another side to this where the Republic could have chosen to not believe him and his evidence, but regardless, that wasn't the point. He could have stopped the war before it started, theoretically. Django did tell her that he promised to make sure Death Watch upheld neutrality with Mandalore itself, believing that Mandalorians were stronger together than separated, and while he would never fully agree with her decision to remove the warrior path from Mandalore, he believed that it was her right, as their leader, to make the decision that would best benefit the society she proceeded over. At the same time, for Django, this mission for him was something he did to keep Tyrannus off of his back for the time being. He had no care for the clones of the Kaminoans or the war in all reality. His only goals now were helping the people of the galaxy and keeping his new family safe. Though he decided that it would be a good idea to remove Shmi and Anakin from their home on Seleucami, just in case anything bad happened. The way Django framed it was family vacation. He quickly crossed the stars and met up with them before abandoning the planet. The best part about Django's military unit was that they didn't need him. They were designed to have set orders. They would follow each of them until their tasks were finished until they got another one. During the battle for some random Outer Rim planet that Satine listed, the Death Watch warriors could join them and they would have a smackdown on the slavers of the system. On Coruscant, the state of the war was completely disrupted. Satine showed up with evidence and provided it before the entire Republic. She was going to Coruscant for a different reason as it was. She was speaking to them about trading with the Confederacy and the Republic, without it being considered an act of war, because trade was very necessary to the success of the neutral systems during this conflict, and she happened to represent all of them. Essentially, she came with the message, confirmed that it wasn't an act of war to do trade, dropped Django's message, and dipped, because it wasn't any of her concern. The fallout of the Clone War being a manifestation of Dooku's, as well as a political war that Palpatine was dumb enough to get himself dragged into, created an all-around terrible situation for the Sith, and not for Satine. It led to the removal of both heads of state. Palpatine did attempt Order 66, but by the time he did, Shakti had heard the hearings and received confirmation from the Jedi Council to threaten the Kaminoans, which she did. 
It sounds simple, but it wasn't. The only reason it worked like this was because Palpatine had to spend hours inside the Senate chambers, debating with others about everything, and not executing Order 66. Dooku inversely immediately called out Order 99 on Jango's droid army, and tragically, this didn't mean anything for Jango. But the Death Watch, that he now controlled, got massacred, mostly. The rest of them would return to Concordia in shambles. Dooku at the same time had become obsessed with finding and killing Jango, which she was positive was going to happen. The problem for Fett was he didn't want to ask for protection, but how could he not? Slave 1 was big enough for the three of them to comfortably live within, but he still preferred that they weren't living inside of a bounty hunting ship. They found systems across wild space that were uninhabited or had small mining, farming, or industrial towns and settled in them for the time being, before bouncing off to others around. Outside of Jango's struggles, what they were going through wasn't exactly everyone's favorite thing in the galaxy, and it brought a really sluggish war to a halt, because what exactly were they supposed to do? The Senate was preoccupied with the fact that their quote-unquote fearless leader fell for the scam of the galaxy. Irony being, many of them were upset that they got played as well, and they were taking it out on Palpatine, he was their scapegoat. Dooku was immediately removed from power and he turned the Separatist weapons against the CIS government without Palpatine's control. He figured that if the galaxy was going to crumble, then he might as well be the anchor when it came back to life. So Dooku took his shot. Grievous was also in his control. Palpatine was out of power, and the Republic elected Anaconda Far to be their wartime leader. Jango, despite losing access to his droid forces, was able to sit back and watch with Anakin and Shmi. No one was happy about it, but in a weird way, this alternative could be better for the galaxy. He did impart a message for Death Watch, and explained to them that he and Satine had created an alliance. Their orders for the time being were to stay placed on Concordia and continue training. He didn't really want them to do anything extra. After all, bo reported on their casualties and how bad they were, so they really shouldn't be doing anything. This time away from the galaxy led to Jango speaking to Anakin and Shmi about deeper, more ethical questions. Did he do the right thing? Was he supposed to do more or less? Anakin didn't think so, believing that the situation was far larger than he. Though Shmi was a little harder, believing that he could have prevented this conflict. However, she understood why he didn't because without the actual conflict itself, things could have flown under the radar and gotten worse when the conflict actually came. The war challenged people to see the reality of the situation, and without that challenge, Jango's words may have meant nothing. The Clone War, so infant into its beginning, simply went from a planned war into an unplanned offensive, but Palpatine would be damned if he let Dooku steal his thunder. If the Kaminoans were going to stop him from controlling the clone army, then he would take control over the droid armies and they would begin their march on the galaxy. As Palpatine was going to take down Dooku, Jango was blitzed by battle droids out on a frontier planet. Unbeknownst to him, Dooku had put a tracker into Slave 1, which meant that once Order 99 was redone, the droids were sent into territory Jango was known to be at, with one directive, kill the bounty hunter and his family. But because Slave 1 bounced around to so many planets in the same sector so quickly, the droids had to stop everywhere, further meaning that when Jango was attacked, it was by a detachment of 50 or so battle droids, which wasn't even a challenge for the bounty hunter. He and Anakin tag-teamed the droids, firing away at them from above and below, while Jango at the end used his darksaber to destroy whatever remained. Though there was a great benefit from this little surprise attack. Father and son fully finished putting together 3PO a couple years back, who they accidentally left at the farm in Slukumai, whoopsies, but this meant that they could either reprogram these droids or do something even more drastic. They did have to leave if they didn't do it as quickly and productively as they needed to. Jango and Anakin cut the heads of the droids off and started working on their circuitry. Using what little tools and time they had, they were able to learn that the droids were activated with Order 99 which pretty much hard reset them into a mode of instability. This is why the Mandalorians were turned on, which Jango had learned about in the aftermath. So he figured that if they could, together, reconfigure a couple of these battle droids, they might be able to send a virus back through the droid command with a simple verbal override. It took some hard craftsmanship, a couple yelling at where the light should be and where it shouldn't be, and it also would have been easier had they not accidentally abandoned 3 po at home but they sent a couple little droids back to the ship and back to the fleet, and they would report Jango and his family's execution, send out the override command, 
Order 99, and relay it to the rest of the army, which turned into a very quick death for the Sith. Jango, Anakin, and Shmi bounced off that world. In the time since Dooku had sent out his orders to kill Jango, he defeated Sidious in a duel before being killed by Palpatine's electricity, leaving Sidious in command of the droid military that would very soon conquer the galaxy. Jango's orders would disrupt all of that, sending the droids into a rebellion on their fleshy overlords, including General Grievous, and then putting them all into an almost zombie-like dormant state, where they tried to develop their own artificial intelligence without anything to go off of other than the programming of war and each other, bickering with each other. While this might not seem like it would affect much, it would completely destabilize the Techno Union and Trade Federation, leaving two conglomerates in shambles, though this for the Clone War also meant a complete economic shutdown. Due to an entire government getting eviscerated by Dooku, the Republic was forced to do damage control with already untrusting systems and planets. Without Palpatine though, they actually had a chance at rebuilding broken bonds and potentially making amends with the people wronged by his rule and the few month old conflict. Because the droids were a massive military force sitting dormant out in the mid rim and outer rim, the Republic decided to address them respectively, but also with a hint of intention. They didn't want to start another conflict, and they wanted the droids to have their own free will, so they were kind of in a bind, because this force could become aggressive at any one point and turn on the galaxy. There were suggestions for an outer rim expansion, but instead, they gave all the droids exclusive access to the unknown regions. It would give the battle droids a chance to find their places of belonging. Little did the droids realize how uncivilized the unknown regions were and how it was kind of a trick. The devastation of the short war came with a very jarring conclusion, one that forced the Republic and Neutral Systems Coalition to seize control over the former Confederacy territory and uplift it. Outside of the intergalactic political hemisphere, Shmi, Jango, and Anakin returned to Seleucami with a Murkwell. Their lives would continue from there, and while their family remained a blended one, eventually with Jango finding his own spouse inside the local town on the planet, they lived lives of fullness and completion. Jango wouldn't, himself, return to the Outer Rim to besiege planets that were destroyed by slavery, but an incentive inspired by him would, thanks to Satine forcing the Republic to bend to an expansion bill and the reunification of the galaxy. She would eventually enlist the former Death Watch members as their formal military, and the Darksaber would remain in Jango's custody, eventually getting passed down to his first son, Anakin. It would remain a legacy artifact in their family for generations to come. It was a nice home out here on Seleucami, and they would stay here, away from the politics of the core and away from the expansion of the criminal worlds. Jango wouldn't ever know it, having felt so much guilt for what he had done during the Clone Wars and before it, but his name would be immortalized to others across the galaxy as the FET initiative was what freed all the slaves from the Outer Rim, and the Django expansion was what led to the unification of the Outer Rim to the rest of the Republic. But he never needed to hear of such accolades. He may have saved the galaxy from the Sith, war, and slavery, but at the end, all that mattered was his ever-growing, big, happy family. And that, my friends, is I think that's a wholesome PP story right there. Special thanks to our patrons, Darth Wells, Darth Maelstrom, Ozpin, Darth Vitiate, Seiju Jagger, Root36, Hunter Belden, Rosebird, Angel Dust, Alexander Reese, The Beginning and End, Django Fett Clone, Nick5098, Ben Ingram, The Big Red Pure Mark, Diamond Constant, Darth Nemesis, Lord Tib, CC2024, Galama Gaming, Tristan, Mandalore, Sir William1767, Darth Revan, Grand Nifty Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Colin Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlinger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, We Was 70, Annika Steak Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Johnny DeGuin, Sense Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. E Gamer, Lord Cali, Yelling Slayer 66, Mammoth Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Fortress Lakes of Star Wars, Erebus, Rex the Wolf, The Man with Three First Names, Dark State 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing. For supporting the channel, giveaway down below 140k. We are almost there, around 900 more left, so let's keep doing a thing. I want to give those Star Destroyers away. Please, let's get them, let's get them going before Thanksgiving. Otherwise, let's talk about the story. I really wanted to kind of focus on Django's um, sentence in Attack of the Clones. A simple man making his way through the universe. And it's kind of like this whole concept where he's trying to do the right thing and it kind of just, it grows beyond him in a way that he doesn't really know how to comprehend. I'm not saying Django's stupid, but I'm also saying like, there's something deeper in him and I wanted to kind of explore that. I think exploring something like that is a lot more interesting. I think the father-son dynamic with a kid that's already grown up is very important. I think in some ways there's a there's an interpretation where Django projected a lot of himself on the Boba, which is why Boba became big bad bounty hunter guy. 
Um, and it's kind of explored in different, like the Bad Batch video I did or the Anakin video I did, where he's raised by people or around people that enlighten him. And I think the issue is Boba was trying so hard to be like Django. Whereas in this situation, Django is not trying to influence Anakin to be like him. And a lot of that is from Shmi being like, uh-uh, no bounty hunting. So I think that dynamic worked really well. It was a lot of fun writing this story. I hope you all enjoyed it. I love you all. Spread the love. And always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.